Hello, hello, everybody. <clears throat> okay. Okay, let's begin. Um, Uh, organize the page over here. There we go. Okay, good. All right. <clears throat> one of the um, one of the things that we uh, spoke about once before, um, like three years ago, if I'm not mistaken, uh, we spoke about the seven teachings. This very subject, the seven teachings um, that the Baal Shem Tov taught in the Garden of Eden that were heard by uh, someone known as the Rebbe Rashab. Right, by the Rebbe Rashab. Now, um, these teachings were recorded by his son in a um, kind of in a letter and where he speaks about this um, at length. And he tells the whole background behind it. I'm not going to go into it again. If you want to go have a look, I think it was 2015. Um, it should be, it should still be available at um, on the YouTube uh, YouTube uh, channel, Kabbalah Decoder, Kabbalah Decoder dot com, Kabbalah Decoder dot com. Okay, so <clears throat> I'm not going to go into uh, into the same uh, explanation that I went into last time. Uh, I explained it that way, but. Um, what I will explain is just the story briefly, what happened, and then something quite remarkable about this particular communication that, uh, that took place. So the communication that took place was in the year um, Tafresh Nun Vais, Tafresh Nun Vet, which is 5652, uh, about 126 years ago. 126 years ago. So it's a long time, a long time ago that this incident took place. But the Baal Shem Tov had passed away uh, a long time before that. He passed away um, about more than 100 years before that. But he was teaching these teachings in the Garden of Eden. And this was being listened to. It was, it was heard by the fifth Lubavitcher Rebbe, named the Rebbe Rashab. Uh, and he told this to his um, son. He told the whole story, and uh, that was, that is the way it was recorded. Okay, so now, when was this? When did this take place? It was this coming Sabbath when the whole um, event took place. This coming Sabbath is 126 years since the time that this was actually heard. So, it goes as follows. Um, the first, uh, the first teaching, the teaching was divided into seven actual seven, seven occasions, seven teachings. The first one was after, um, after of what's called Kabbalah Shabbat, after receiving the, the Sabbath. In other words, after the, the, the uh, after the Sabbath came in, obviously it was candle lighting and so on and so forth. And then, um, after, um, the, after the prayers, that's when the first teaching was communicated in God, the Garden of Eden, which was overheard by the Rebbe Rashab. And he said as follows, quoting a verse from this week's uh, Torah reading. Uh, this week's Torah reading is uh, called um, Shabbat Parshat Tavo, Tavo, which is in Devarim Deuteronomy 26.1. Deuter so the verse is in Deuteronomy 26.1. And it reads as follows. When you come to the land, it's talking about when the Israelites will come to the land of Israel, what, the, what they have to do, it speaks about the, what the, the mitzvah, the commandment of what is called Bikurim. Bikurim is the first fruits of the, of the land. The first fruits have to be brought to the temple and so on and so forth and uh, dedicated there. Okay, so that's what it is talking about. And um, the... 
the that's the verse that is talking about, and this is what the Baal Shem, Baal Shem Tov explained. He said, in the word Aretz, when you come to the Aretz, the Aretz is, uh, is the land. But the word Aretz has a number of different explanations, and one of them is from the word Ratzon, Ratzon meaning will. Why is the land of Israel called the land of the will? Because it's the land that seeks to do the will of the Creator. It seeks to do the will of the land that seeks to do the will of the Creator. In other words, the land where the will of the Creator can be best fulfilled. So, when you come to this land, the land where the will of the Creator can be best fulfilled, and you inherit the land, which is a gift from above, which is given to um, the Jewish people, the land of, the land of Israel, um, then what you have to do is the Yashavta Bar, you have to settle the land. The land has to become a settled place. So in other words, um, when you settle the land, then you shall take from the first fruits of the land and put them in a basket and go to the place that God chooses, in other words, to Jerusalem, and offer your, bring your offering there of the first fruits. So the Baal Shem Tov explained, you shall take the fruits and put them in a basket. In other words, draw down the spiritual energy and put it into the appropriate vessel. Put it into the vessel that will be able to contain that energy and then go to the place that God will choose. This means, obviously, clearly it means to Jerusalem, but it also means if you go to the place that God will choose since the Torah itself is eternal and, there's no, and it is relevant at all times, therefore the intention is wherever it is that a person goes is by divine providence and the intention and the purpose of this is to cause his name to dwell there. In other words, um, when you uh, when you come to when you come to the holy temple, what's the purpose of going there? The purpose is to cause His name to dwell. To cause the name of God to dwell wherever it is that you go. In other words, to reveal godliness wherever it is that you go. And how do you do that? Through verses of Psalms, uh, through saying a blessing, and so on and so forth. That was. Um, uh, that was essentially the uh, first teaching. I'm going to skip. There were seven teachings altogether. But I'm, going to, I'm going to skip to the one that uh, I want to focus on tonight, which is the fourth teaching. And the fourth teaching is on a verse in Psalms. It is the first verse of Psalm 89, where the, um, uh, the psalm begins with the words, Maskil Eitan HaEzrachi. This is a song, a, uh, a song or a poem. The word maskil really refers to seichel, to intellect. Um, uh, but a maskil, in this sense, is a very cleverly composed psalm. Maskil la eitan ha maskil to eitan, uh, uh, sorry, of eitan. We'll see who eitan is in a moment. ha who came from the east. Now, eitan is... The sages explain this refers to Abraham, Abraham, who is called Eitan. Uh, why is he called Eitan? Uh, because he was the first one to bring light into the world. That's why he's called Eitan Hayezrahi. He's called Eitan because he had tremendous courage. The word Eitan actually refers to something that cannot be budged, or somebody that cannot be budged, something that doesn't budge. In other words, the concept of absolute strength and determination to carry through the mission that he felt he was uh, appointed to. And that was to, um, uh, what Abraham's mission was, was to, um, as we said before, publicize godliness in the world. Abraham was the first one, essentially, who um, made the concept of idolatry anathema up until that time everybody worshiped idolatry um, they'd forgotten by by the time that abraham came along they'd forgotten completely uh about the creator and they simply wor worshiped the forces within creation abraham um 
meditated on, on, on the creation and came to the conclusion that it's not possible that the creation brought itself, that all the universe brought itself into being. It must have been brought into being by, by some force. And he started examining all the forces of nature that he knew about, that he was aware of, and he realized it couldn't be them. It certainly couldn't be the moon. It couldn't be the sun. It couldn't be. And he began to go through all of the various uh, possibilities that he could think of. And it turned out, turns out that none of them were the... Um, none of them could have been the one that created the others. So he came to the conclusion correctly, obviously, that there is a creator. So this uh, concept uh, of Eitan HaEzrahi, the, um, um, the idea of Eitan HaEzrahi refers to, as explained in Hasidic teachings, refers to the inner dimension of the soul. It refers to the inner dimension of the soul, the Eitan, the unbudging, unmoving, unchanging aspect of a human being, that is called Eitan. Even though it refers to Abraham, essentially, in the, uh, in the Psalms, nevertheless, it refers to each and every one of us in terms of the inner dimension of the soul. And uh, he went on to say that the, the simplicity of the essence of God is revealed even more in simple people than it is revealed in people of great uh, learning, of great um, uh, knowledge and understanding. And this is what I actually want to explain uh, now. But first, before we get into that, if you would imagine that we're talking here about the Baal Shem Tov being in the Garden of Eden. Now, just to understand what it means uh, for a soul after it leaves this world to be uh, in the Garden of Eden. Like, what does that really mean? Now, obviously, we're not talking about any kind of geographical place. We're talking about a spiritual state. This spiritual state called the Garden of Eden usually um, happens to a person a righteous person, a saintly person, who after he passes away from this world, so his soul ascends to a spiritual dimension called the Garden of Eden. But the body doesn't usually go there. <laughs> uh, there is a story about one of the uh, sages of the Zohar, a very interesting story, that... Um, was very close to the time that he was going to pass away from the world and sort of as a courtesy which is often done with uh, great saintly people they're told um, when their time is going to be up in fact the story is told about the Mol Shem Tov that he knew exactly when his time was going to be up and he dedicated the last two hours of his life that he gave back to he gave back to God he said uh, you take these two hours and do with them as you wish now, that's not a simple thing. The Baal Shem Tov, as we'll see, uh, had a tremendous, tremendous um, love of his, his mission in this world, which was, again, to make the world realize its own godly nature, its own godly source, and its own godly potential. So giving away two hours was a big, uh, was a big deal. But anyway, uh, to get back to the story of the sage, one of the sages of the Zohar, the sage is um, uh, Rabbi Abba, was his name, Rabbi Abba. So Rabbi Abba um, was actually the one who was um, appointed by Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai to actually write down the teachings of the Zohar. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai wrote a certain portion of it, but it was, uh, the rest of it was written by Rabbi Abba, Rabbi Abba. So when it was time for Rabbi Abba to pass away from this world, uh, he was uh, informed beforehand. And he said, well, wait a second, not so fast, right? I'm not, uh, I'm not going there until I know where it is uh, that I am going. Uh, talk about crossing the barrier or boundary. Yes, it could be. It depends on what the context is. Uh, then it depends on the context. Uh, in any event, uh, Rabbi Abba um, uh, was told that he was going to the Garden of Eden, and he said, not so fast. Uh, I want to see where I'm going before, uh, before I agree to go there. 
Now, you might think that this is a bit of a, what you call Jewish chutzpah, you know, this might be a bit of a cheek, a bit of a, you know, um, uh, uh, how do you say, how do you say it in English? Um, in American English. Cheek, it's chutzpah. Everybody knows what chutzpah is, I suppose, right? Uh, in any event, um, so he, um, they took him, they said to him, okay, we're going to show you your spot from the wall that surrounds Gan Eden, the barrier, so to speak, that surrounds the Garden of Eden. Now, again, this is, the story is told in uh, material terms, physical terms, but obviously that's not the intention. So they said to him, we're going to take you up there and we're going to show you your place. So they took him up and they pointed out the place where he's going to be and he jumped right from the top of the wall into the Garden of Eden. Uh, without going through death first. So there was an uproar in, uh, in heaven and the angels were all, uh, you know, <laughs> all upset, you con man, you know, whatever, they were all upset and, uh, and tried to um, uh, convince him to leave. So, no, I'm staying, I'm not leaving, I'm here. And that's it, I'm done, yeah? <laughs> I'm not, I ain't going nowhere, as I would say in New York. Okay, so what happened? Um, they took the case to the Beit Din Shelmaila. They took the case before the heavenly uh, court. And the heavenly court um, adjudicated the case. And they said, um, since he's already there, there's not much you can do, right? You can't take him out now. It's not, uh, that, that wouldn't work. You can't take him out. So they left him there. So Rabbi Abba went to the Garden of Eden without going through the process of death and this is a possibility for uh, in other cases as well but um, that nevertheless was his um, uh, was his lot to go to the Garden of Eden without now what happens in the Garden of Eden there are many sages um, who have promised that they will refuse to go into the Garden of Eden until the Messiah comes. In other words, they refuse to go in in their place and everything is, 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 uh, is uh, basically stopped in, in heavens until the sage gets in. The story is told about Rabbi Levi Yitzhak of Adichiv, that when he passed away, uh, he refused to enter the Garden of Eden until the Mashiach would come, until um, the Messiah would come and redeem uh, the world. And um, it obviously wasn't time yet, so um, they said, okay, you can stay where you are, outside of the Garden of Eden, but um, what we have to do is uh, we have to, uh, it's, it's now time to pray the afternoon prayers. Uh, do you want to join, you want to join the minion, you know, do you want to join in? So not thinking about it, he said, yes, he wants to join in. So once he said, I'm joining the, I'm joining the, you know, for, for to, them, to pray the prayers, one can pray on one's own, but it's always better to pray with a quorum with 10, at least 10, 10 men. So once he joined, he was stuck in the Garden of Eden, couldn't get out now, right? Well, once he was in, he was in, that's it. You don't know that. You can come in, but you can't leave. So he was stuck there as well. Um, so we see that the Garden of Eden is a place where you can come to, but you can't leave. So um, what happens in the Garden of Eden? Well, everything they learn in the Garden of Eden is in the spiritual dimension of things that are taking place down in this world. There's an interesting idea over here. And that is that um, in the Garden of Eden, I'm sorry, uh, I was just um, checking something over there. In the Garden of Eden, when they learn the spiritual aspect of uh, the spiritual dimensions of things that are studied down here in this world, they understand it obviously in the spiritual dimension, not in the physical dimension. Now, in the spiritual dimension, there could be a number of different explanations of the same phenomenon. And therefore, we find stories in the Talmud where... Um, somebody in the Garden of Eden, one of the souls in the Garden of Eden, is told when it comes to um, a particular discussion in the Talmud, uh, a Talmudic discussion or a Jewish legal discussion, um, which they are learning the inner dimension of, that if you want to know what the final 
conclusion is of this discussion, you won't be able to find it here. You have to go down to earth to find out what the explanation is. In other words, you have to go and ask one of the sages what the conclusion of the argument is. You know, go and ask Nachmeni is one of the places that it says in the Talmud. Go and ask him uh, what, the, what the final ruling is. Why? Because in the Garden of Eden, since there is only truth over there, and truth can take many forms, in other words, there's many levels uh, of explanation. The question is, how do all those levels of explanation fit with the physical dimension? Which ones of them fit with the physical dimension? And they can't answer that kind of question in the Garden of Eden. That has to be answered in, uh, down below. It has to be answered by the uh, sages um, down below. Okay, so... Therefore, we have a question. When the Baal Shem Tov was teaching these teachings in the Garden of Eden, seven, seven of them, he was teaching, we see in all of the teachings, he was teaching the primacy and the importance of life in the physical world. All of the seven teachings have to do with that. Now, why would he be doing that? Surely, he would be teaching the spiritual dimension of things. However, the answer to that is that the teaching of the Baal Shem Tov, the teachings of the Baal Shem Tov, are directed towards understanding and harmonizing the highest spiritual levels with the physicality of this world. And that is the essence of Kabbalah. The essence of Kabbalah, the way the Baal Shem Tov taught it, is to harmonize all of the world with the physical world. Since that was his whole goal in this life down here in this world, that remained his goal in the Garden of Eden. Now, there's a story told uh, about one very great, um, it was a very great disciple of um, one of the Hasidic rabbis. He was actually initially a disciple of Rabbi Shneur Zaman Uliadi, the author of the Tanya. Then he became a disciple of his, um, of the person who took, took his place after Rabbi Shneur Zaman passed away, the son of Rabbi Shneur Zaman, whose name is Rabbi Dovber. And then uh, he lived a long life. He was also the disciple of the grandson of the author of the Tanya, of Rabbi Shneir Zalman, whose name is Rabbi Menachem Mendel, also of Lubavitch, Rabbi Menachem Mendel of Lubavitch. So he was a disciple of all of those three, um, all of those three grand rabbis, Rebbes, all of those three tzaddikim, saintly masters of Kabbalah. Uh, to the extent that he himself is called a half a Rebbe. He, uh, people talk about him as uh, um, a half a saint as well. He never founded his own dynasty, but he remained a disciple of the uh, one of those Rebbes, first Rabbi Shnei Zalman, then Rabbi Dovber, and then Rabbi Menachem Mendel. He remained their disciples, and he never became himself an independent Rebbe, although he certainly had the qualifications to do that. Uh, at the age of 11, uh, 11, 11 years old, he was expert in the entire Talmud. By the age of 13, he was expert in the Zohar and the Eitz Chaim as well and knew them by heart, right, in the original language. <laughs> so you can see what kind of a person he was. He wasn't a simple person at all. But he was not born into a Hasidic family. He didn't, he was, his father was not a, um, um, a follower of a Hasidic rabbi. He was an anti, but he wasn't a follower. When he first became involved in Hasidic thinking, his first teacher was someone named Rabbi Zalman Zezmer. Rabbi Zalman, Zalman Zezmer. And when he first st began to study with him, and now again, this, is, this was a young man who was an absolute genius, right? He was an absolute genius. Um, again, at the age of 13, he was an expert in Kabbalah already. Um, so when he first began to study with Rabbi Zalman Zezmer, so Rabbi Zalman taught him the following, the meaning of the following verse. There's a verse in Job, 
uh, which says, Mibesari echeze eloka. From my flesh I perceive godliness. From my flesh I perceive godliness. How does that work? What's the, um, what's the idea here? So Rabbi Zalman Zezmer told him as follows. He said, he said to him, um, if you study your physical form, you study your body, your physical body, your physical being in this world, you will see that it reflects godly events and powers and, uh, and concepts. So Reb Hillel, who was this genius of a young, uh, of a young man, said up until that time, I had been of the, under the impression that the body was just a, it was a hassle. It was an unnecessary, uh, well, let's not, let's not say unnecessary. It was an, um, um, something that encumbered me, it limited me, and was something that I just had to drag around with my soul. The soul is primary and the body is strictly worth nothing. Um, that's the way he had understood it up until that time. But now he understood things completely differently. He said, this was a whole new beginning for me. It was a whole new way of understanding that the body itself was a holy thing. It was a holy vessel. Since it's a vessel for the soul, since the body is a vessel for the soul, and it's a vessel, a vessel actually for three levels of soul, and it is enveloped by another two levels, there are five levels of soul, five levels of consciousness, as we've spoken about many times. The lowest level of consciousness is called nefesh. Nefesh, N-E-F-E-S-H. Actually, I probably have, um, I probably have a map over here that I should share with you. Just one second. I didn't get this up earlier. Uh, um, here we go. Uh, no, this is not the right one. I'm sorry. No, wrong one. <laughs> um, here we go. Superior. And Um, all right, I'm having a hard time finding it. All right, I'll tell you what. <clears throat> I'll just spell it out to you. The lowest level of soul, the lowest level of, uh, of consciousness is called nefesh. Now, what is nefesh? Nefesh is the life force of the body. The body itself has a separate existence. It doesn't come into existence through the soul. The two things that are put together at the time that a person is born, it says, like this, it's a blessing that we say every morning, God, the soul that you place within me is pure, holy. It's pure. You created it. You formed it. And you blew it into me. All of those refer to various levels of soul. You blew it into me, the breath of life. That breath of life is called the nefesh. Nefesh. Um, which is the lowest level. The life force of the body. As soon as the nefesh leaves, when a person dies, when the nefesh dies, with, uh, when the nefesh dies, in other words, that manifestation of divine energy that keeps you alive is withdrawn, then the body dies. And eventually disappears. Um, if the body has that importance to the soul, is that one of the reasons why we need to keep our body pure, a place for Hashem to live in the world? Absolutely. I was getting to that. I was getting to that. That's absolutely uh, correct, Dennis. Um, yes. The idea is that since the body is the vessel for the soul, therefore we have to treat, and the Baal Shem Tov was very, emphasized this very much. He was very much against these uh, 
this concept of self-flagellation or inflicting harm on oneself. There was a certain group of people called the uh, Hasidia Ashkenaz, um, the pious ones, who, we'll be talking about 10th, 11th century, who were very much into um, inflicting suffering upon oneself uh, with long periods of fasting, fasting from uh, Sabbath to Sabbath. They wouldn't eat the whole week, right? Fasting from Sabbath to Sabbath, depriving themselves of sleep, rolling in the snow, uh, things like that. Even you see, even see sometimes in the Tikkunim of the Arizal, this kind of thing. The Baal Shem Tov was very much against it. And he said, you have to treat the body as a holy vessel, as a holy vessel for the soul. And um, even though the Baal Shem Tov sometimes also did not eat from Sabbath to Sabbath, uh, on many occasions actually, um, this was not because he was fasting. <laughs> That's the way I explained it. I wasn't fasting, I just didn't eat. I didn't, didn't, didn't get around to it. In other words, the desire for food kind of left him. He wasn't, uh, he didn't have, he didn't have a desire for food anymore. And uh, therefore he didn't notice that he didn't eat until the eating was a mitzvah, which is a mitzvah on Shabbos, it's a commandment on Shabbos, on the Sabbath to eat, to eat and drink. So until that time, he didn't feel the need to at all. He just didn't feel the need. He didn't eat for the whole, uh, the whole week. Okay, so that kind of concept, that kind of idea um, is the life force of the body is nevertheless divine life force. It's the breath of God, so to speak. God breathed the breath of living soul into Adam. And he became a living soul. So since that's the vessel for the breath of God, so to speak, we have to treat it appropriately. We can't treat it as a piece of uh, garbage or something that we have to mistreat in order to get closer to God. On the contrary, God gives you a gift. You're supposed to treat it with, uh, with a proper um, respect. Now, why is it then that earlier generations had a different... Uh, approach. The reason is because until essentially until the time of the Bolshemtov, the direction of Kabbalah had always been to seek the higher world. In other words, um, to rise up through the various worlds to the highest level of God consciousness as it is in the highest world, as in the world of Atzilut and Adam Kadmon. From the time of the Baal Shem Tov, his approach was to bring that knowledge, that wisdom, that experience down into this world. The truth is that in the time of the temple, in temple times, the both of those two um, aspects rising up to the highest possible levels and bringing godliness down were regarded as equal. They're called Ratso Vashov in, uh, in Kabbalah. In, actually, in, in the Tanakh, in, uh, in the writing in the Merkava, in the chariot that Ezekiel saw, that Yechezkel saw, they called Vahachayot Ratso Vashov. The Chayot, these angels that are called Chayot Ratso Vashov, they were going up and coming down, going up and coming down. Uh, we spoke about this last week. Um, but don't read as chayot, but chayut. The life force is going up and coming down. In other words, the whole purpose of creation is to be down here in this world. That's why we are put here. So we have a purpose here. And that purpose is a holy purpose. It's l'shaken sham to make God's name known in the world. So therefore, when Rabbi Hillel was taught by Rabbi Zalman Zezmer for the first time that from my flesh I see God, he started to treat his physical being completely differently. It wasn't something to be ignored, to be bypassed for the supremacy of the soul. Yes, of course, the soul is supreme over the body. Of course it is. 
but the body is the vessel for that supremacy of the soul. In other words, for the soul to be, to find its fullest expression. God created this world to be a settled place where we do what is necessary to reveal godliness within it. So that, why, that is why the Baal Shem Tov, even in the Garden of Eden, was teaching about putting the lights into the vessels, bringing them down, to cause his name to dwell, Sham down below, down here. Now, whether any of the other um, uh, souls in the Garden of Eden had taught this before, um, we don't really know, but um, that was the teaching of the Baal Shem Tov, and there were many, many uh, the rabbi, uh, the, the rabbi who reported this, who, who actually saw this vision, said that there were many, many souls who had come to listen to this. The souls of men and women and children, everybody was sitting and listening. The souls of people who had passed away when they were uh, even young and were now in the Garden of Eden had come to listen to this. Now, why did the, the, why did the rabbi pass on this message to us? Why did he tell about this vision that he had? Well, obviously the reason is that we would do something about it, that we have to do something about it. Um, and what it is that we have to do about it is make God's name known in the world. In other words, by our own actions, by our actions, people should be able to look at us and say, you know, that's, that's a holy person. That's a person that's a righteous person. There's a person who does the right thing. There's a person who's concerned not only with um, material matters, but is concerned also with spiritual matters. And we admire him for that. Or her. We admire them for that. Um, now, the point is not to garner people's admiration. That's obviously not the purpose. But the purpose is to live such a life that it is noticeable that um, one lives a life of holiness and a life of uh, dedication to um, dedication to God, essentially. Dedication to God, dedication to doing godly things in the world, dedication to improving the lot of those people around us and people we come into contact with uh, by giving them the ability and the possibility of um, of tapping into the same thing. Okay, um, I think we're going to end it here. Uh, just a reminder that the course is already up. For those of you who didn't get my email, the course is already up. Uh, I think I may have given an incorrect um, uh, address for the website. It is https colon slash slash. I think I might have said www, but it's not www. If you go to www, you'll just get a green page that says uh, not found. Website not found. So it's https colon slash slash Kabbalah decoded hyphen. Kabbalah decoded uh, hyphen. Uh, yeah, I'll put it in the chat. Uh, Kabbalah hyphen decoded. Um, dot teachable dot com. So here it goes. HTTPS Kabbalah uh, decoded. Kabbalah decoded. Uh, oops, spelled wrong again. Kabbalah decoded dot teachable dot com. There we go. Okay. Um, okay. So the first course, uh, which is now available, is uh, just the basics, the basics of Kabbalah, the basic uh, premise of Kabbalah, where it starts, what it's about, um, and so on, what the direction is. Some of what I've just said tonight is, uh, is very apropos over there, and uh, actually uh, some of the same ideas are mentioned there in the beginning. Um, and then I'm, I'm already preparing a second course, which goes into more uh, Kabbalah, more in depth, uh, especially the Sefer Yitzira, Sefer Boyer, Sefer Zohar, and so on and so forth. These more um, um, 
more well-known uh, works that we are going to have a look at and attempt to understand each according to his ability. Okay, are there any questions? Uh, okay, so there's a question, what is meant by harmonizing the worlds with the physical world? So let me give you an analogy. Let's say um, several different people are looking at a painting. One person is looking at the painting, he himself is uh, an artist. And what he looks at when he looks at the painting is not necessarily the idea behind the painting, but the craft, the, uh, the uh, skill that the painter used. How did he get that um, blend of light and shadow, of light and darkness in the picture? I'm just giving an example, right? How did he get that blend of it? How did he get the blend of colors? What exactly did he do with the uh, texture of the picture? So someone will look at the picture and they look at it in a sort of a very technical way and you'll see it that kind of a way, right? Another person um, will, when he looks at the picture, will feel sort of an emotional arousal. It's a very calm scene or a, a very uh, a scene of tremendous upheaval, or whatever it is, right? And that person will focus more on the emotional aspect of uh, the picture, what the picture is telling him. A third person, let's say a psychologist, will come along and he'll try to examine the psychological state of the person who uh, painted the painting. Like, why did he paint this painting? What would message was he trying to get across? Why did he need to get this message across? Another person will look at it, a philosopher, and he'll uh, try and understand what's the basic principle over here that this picture is trying to, this painting is trying to communicate. Now, all of those things are all valid reactions to a painting. They're all valid reactions. And they were probably all intended, whether consciously or unconsciously, by the painter. What Kabbalah will come and try to do is if we, if we uh, make all of these different interpretations analogous to different worlds, what the Kabbalists will come and try and do is harmonize all of them, show how all of them are actually based on the same painting and all of them have the same ultimate intention and all of them are in harmony with one another because they're all, after all, of the same painting. So that's what Kabbalah tries to do. Harmonize everything from the most, the deepest spiritual aspects to the most revealed physical, material aspects of the world. And that all of them are a single harmony and all of them work in concert and all of them work together. Anything that happens down here is a result of something that happens in a deeper world, in a higher world. Anything that happens in the higher world can be affected by the things that we do down here. Um, I hope that that answers uh, that question.